Lord be with you. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand, or at my left, is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. It was the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In recent weeks, I've preached on some important theological definitions and questions like, what is the gospel? What are angels? Are all sins the same to God? And in late summer, we had that whole series about the real presence. Most years, on this particular Sunday, I would focus on the danger of narcissism, how we all tend to be so self-focused, and how Jesus calls us to put our focus on others, to put God first, and then others second, and ourselves third. This time, I'd like to draw our attention to those closing words of the gospel for today, when Jesus says, the Son of Man also came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's actually that last phrase, to give his life as a ransom for many, that ties in closely with the epistle and the Old Testament reading that we're given for today. What is the concept to which Jesus refers? The word ransom here is only used in this verse and in the parallel text over in Matthew's Gospel. And it means that Jesus, who calls himself the Son of Man, which is an Old Testament title for the Messiah, Jesus paid the price for our redemption, the ransom for our redemption, thus making it possible. He gave himself up as a sacrificial offering, the price of our atonement. That word atonement, like that word gospel, is a compound English word. And it's a word for reconciliation. It's about bringing two estranged parties, God and man, back together again to be at one. It translates the Hebrew kippur from the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. The great day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year in Judaism, is a day of fasting and repentance seeking that reconciliation with God, reversing the disorder in our lives and in our world, the uncleanness, putting things back in place, putting us back at one with God. Of course, during the Old Testament temple period, there was a complex ritual of sacrifice on that day. The priest symbolically, metaphorically, laid all the sins of the people on two goats and a bull. One goat was banished. That's where we get scapegoat. The other goat and the bull were sacrificed, slaughtered, and their blood was offered on the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, 
This is the only one day of the year where the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Under the law of Moses, and even before, everything is purified by sacrifice. And in fact, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So bloodshed is very important in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Because in Leviticus, as it says, the life is in the blood. So what we have here is a solemn exchange, a life for a life. So a sacrifice is essentially an act of redemption, much like you would redeem something with a coupon. You're handing something over to buy or buy back something in return. And so here we have a life for a life. Sin, of course, is always destructive, even life-destroying. So here is a life destroyed as a substitute and a reminder of the great cost of sin. Under the law of Moses, another thing you'll notice is that the firstborn always belongs to God, almost like the tithe, the first fruits belong to God. When the baby Jesus is presented in the temple, remember a sacrifice of pigeons is offered to redeem him, to buy him back, because the firstborn belongs to God. At the end of his ministry, like the scapegoat, he is cast outside the city and offers his life as a redeeming sacrifice, a vicarious, substitutionary atonement to redeem, to buy us back. The Son of Man gave his life as a ransom for many. Of course, the Eucharist that we celebrate here today is a memorial of that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, where his sacrifice is mystically made present on the altar through the separate consecration of the bread as his body and the wine as his blood. The fruits of that offering are shared with us in a sacrificial banquet, a feast. You will note how the beautiful language of the Eucharistic prayer of consecration begins, describing what we're all about here today. All glory be to Thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that Thou of Thy tender mercy didst give Thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by His one oblation of Himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Now, we're accustomed to hearing the superlative form in Old Testament Hebrew, which repeats a word. We would say, like, good, better, and best, but they would say, holy, holy, holy. In this case, Cranmer repeats the idea, but in multiple facets as he goes along, combining that with a threefold description of excellence, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. In our Old Testament lesson today from Isaiah, we hear the song of the suffering servant, one of several, and it's so familiar to us from Lent that many assume when they hear it, it's actually from the New Testament, but it's not. It's from Isaiah. But it speaks so directly of Jesus in His passion on the way to the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with His stripes we are healed. With the obvious victory over sin and death shown in Jesus' resurrection, and the reconciliation, the atonement with God accomplished at the cross, the letter to the Hebrews tries to make sense of it all, in terms of that Old Testament temple sacrificial system. It explains how Jesus is our ultimate great high priest. Unlike the earthly priests, he entered into the real Holy of Holies, God's throne room in heaven. Unlike the earthly priests, Jesus did not offer the blood of an animal. Rather, as the sinless lamb himself, he offered his own blood, 
on the mercy seat as both the priest and the sacrificial victim, he made redemption for us. We find in the New Testament that multiple explanations and analogies are used to help us understand why this works, how it makes sense. We continue that on in church history. St. Anselm famously used the medieval economics of the day as a lesson to teach this idea of satisfaction. And these all came together to reinforce the idea that Jesus' offering makes up for all the damage caused by human sin. St. Paul tells us that the sacrificial blood of Jesus makes hilasterion in the Greek. We translate that expiation for sin. Hearkening back to that ritual of Yom Kippur, Pope Benedict explained in his book on Jesus, The thinking here is that the blood of the victim into which all human sins are absorbed actually touches the divinity and thereby cleanses. And in the process, human beings are represented by the blood, are purified through that contact with God. Only a single drop of that priceless shed blood is enough to atone for every sin, Pope Benedict concludes, in his self-offering on the cross, Jesus, as it were, brings all the sins of the world deep within the love of God and wipes it away. Accepting the cross, entering into fellowship with Christ, means entering that realm of transformation. One further point. Remember how Jesus put it. A ransom for many... For many. What does that mean? Is that an idea of limited atonement? Does it mean that Christ only offered himself for some, just for the elect, and not for all who are lost and in need of redemption? Well, to be clear, the church is always taught that Christ died for all, that his sacrifice provided redemption for all of humanity. The question of limited atonement really only came up in the late 1500s, early 1600s, in dispute between most Calvinists on the one hand and the followers of Jacob Arminius on the other. Both sides agreed that Christ's sacrifice was limited to the elect. Their disagreement had to do with the grounds of that limitation. For Arminius, the ground was the free choice of people to believe or not believe. For the other Calvinists, it was limited based on God's predestination. Everything was set and fixed in advance. Reformed pastors and theologians today continue to hold that belief. For example, according to a a sermon from Dr. Stephen Lawson, uh, the former pastor over at uh, Trinity Bible Church in Dallas, he said in that sermon, quote, Our Lord died only for the disciples of Jesus Christ. Not one drop of blood was shed beyond the disciples. It is only for his own people that he died. It's easy to see where that idea comes from for those who don't believe really in free will. It's a conflation of redemption merited by Christ on the one hand and salvation freely accepted by us on the other. And that view of no human free will is really the driving force here. So with that in mind, Calvinists latch on to verses like the tender shepherd passages in John 10, where Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus says the good shepherd will not lose any of his sheep. These tender passages about the shepherd's pastoral care for the sheep are paired with apocalyptic warnings from Jesus like we find in Matthew 7 and Luke 13, where he warns about how the the road is broad that leads to perdition, and many are lost, while the road to paradise is narrow, and few find it and follow that path. Discounting free will, it makes it seem like God has only concern for his chosen few. The rest are all hopelessly lost. Christ 
need not redeem the unredeemable. But is that really the proper perspective? What if we do have free will? Even if it's wounded, what if we can choose to accept God's grace? The grace would have to be available for all. In John 3.16, of course, we're told that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In 1 John 2.2, we're told that Jesus is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. In Hebrews 2.9, we read that Jesus tasted death for every man. Limited atonement is the kind of teaching that Catholics and most Protestants consider to be not merely false doctrine, but repugnant, even blasphemous. Paul says in Romans 5.6, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. That means Christ died for me, for you, for everyone we'll ever meet, for everyone who will watch this message 50 years from now. Christ is your Redeemer. He gave Himself up as a ransom for many. That word many there, polis in Greek, is where we get the prefix poly. In English, we say, when we say many, we tend to look at that as kind of a limiting concept. But if you compare all the other times in the New Testament that word is used, you will see that the Greek polis is more of a magnifying concept. In English, for example, we would say something like myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. Nobody responds by saying, only thousands? We see it as kind of an expression of endlessness, openness, multitudinous. That's the kind of concept we have here. Generous, overflowing grace and atonement. Unlimited mercy for any that would have it. There will always be grace enough for you. Jesus shed His blood to pay the price for your soul. And if you accept that gift, you are His and He is yours. Follow Him now and always as your Savior and Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.